some of the areas that I'm going to speak to today are future trends in the fishing industry, pre-packaged convenience meals, sustainability certifications, collaborative marketing through industry, online sales and marketing, external forces, innovation in business and a role it plays. So that, that's a lot of things, it's a lot of stuff. Uh, but before I start, I just thought I'd make mention about that the fishing industry is valued at two and a half billion dollars per year. It's a huge number. And as Robert said, we're gonna be heading for three billion dollars in the next number of years to 2020. That's a huge jump. How are we going to do that? Who are the people that are gonna help us do that? Um, I'd like to share some of my ideas and views around those things. And before I do that, I thought I would share with you a, uh, a quick video on our company. So how is it that we get that story, that exciting, sexy story about fishing out, connect it with our products and get it out into the marketplace? There's something about fishing, that quintessential Aussie, bronze Aussie, the, um, the hunter-gatherer mentality. You know, it's, it's, an, it's an exciting story. It's so much more exciting than uh, when I see pictures of blocks of dirt and uh, growing apple trees, seeing cows wandering around eating grass. There's, there's something about fishing that I think that we really need to try and connect ourselves and connect it to our product and get that story out into the public. So just a little bit about, about raptors. As you heard earlier, I grew up in the, uh, in the Gulf of Carpentaria. I'm a third generation uh, family member in our fishing company. I had the opportunity of, um, of working with my grandfather who taught me how to mend nets when I was about 12 years old. And I remember my father um, forcing me, making me go out and work out in the trawlers in my school holidays. And I would come back in and he'd say to me, son, you know, what is it you'd like to do with your life? And I would say, well, Dad, I, I really like playing the guitar. <laughs> and he said, well, that's great uh, because you're, you can do anything that you want with your life, anything you want, as long as it, it's in the fishing business. <laughs> so, okay, okay, that's great. So I've worked with my, uh, with my mum and my, and my uncles and my father and we've been very, very passionate about our business for a very long time. And we've gone from essentially what was the entrepreneurial spirit of those early days of building boats and catching prawns and catching fish and getting it to market and essentially taking whatever we could get in terms of a price for our product. It was many years we were in the export market, then eventually it changed to the domestic market 
but there was there was no real real kind of vision. There was no there was no um, view about what it is that we can best do to get the most we can for our product. So what 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 are the future trends? How is it that we can get the 10, 11,000 tonnes of seafood that my company handles, and how can we take our company from turning over $100 million to $150 million? Um, essentially, that's what we've been able to do the last couple of years. We've, um, heading to the end of this financial year, to close to $150 million. So we've been able to subscribe to getting better value for our product through innovative ideas about connecting the story to our product, sharing the story with our customers and broadening our customer base and getting our product in the right format. So this is something that's um, becoming quite popular. Uh, Pre-packaged convenience meals are now alongside um, beef and chicken and pork and it's taking up real estate space. And it's being sold predominantly or primarily in the, uh, in the supermarket sector in this country. And it's very, very new. It's a, it's a relatively new thing. So we're now processing our own product along with other products that we're uh, purchasing and trading as well. And, uh, and we're getting it into this format. And it now represents about 10% of seafood sales in the supermarket sector in this country. In comparison to the, it representing approximately 50% of seafood sales in the UK. So there's definitely an opportunity for our market to continue to develop, grow and mature like it has elsewhere. So with the convenience meals, we've taken the opportunity now to start to connect our own products into, into, this, uh, into this product range. So crimson snapper fillets, um, we catch in the Northern Territory, one of our fish trawlers up there, and we've been looking for opportunities to try and get our product into a variety of different formats, this being one of them, to try and capitalise on improving our value back to ourselves. So it's essentially getting something, like Dylan was saying yesterday, a $20 Patagonian toothfish, and turning it into a $120 Patagonian toothfish. Effectively, we're trying to do the same thing. Also with our prawns, it's the same thing. We're getting it into, into, the, into the right format. So this is mainly in, um, in the supermarket sector. Prawns and salmon represent a huge proportion, a big percentage of what's being sold. It represents about 70%. It's a big number. For ourselves, fortunately, being mostly uh, catching prawns, it gives us the opportunity to start to look at what is it that we can do to get our product and continue to try and add value. It's about adding value, turning that $100 million business into a $150 million business with the same volume of product. So what's trending? As I said before, um, what's trending is getting your product into the right format. Also, what's trending is with, for example, in the supermarkets, they're always looking for new ideas. They don't want to broaden their vendor base. They want their existing vendors to start to look at ways that they can present their products to the supermarkets in a different format, in a more innovative format, a little bit like what the um, avocado guys did and putting avocados now in a tube and, uh, and, and subscribing to a greater value. Another one is uh, MAP or Skin Pack. That's another product that's coming through at the moment. It's a, it's a variation of those convenience meals where um, the product, instead of being in a, in a tray um, that is already sourced, it will be presented in, with a vacuum skin over the top of it and, uh, and it's just, it presents better, it shows the, the clarity and the colour of the product, it works very well with prawns, it ver works very well with a number of different fish. 
So for me, the ready-to-go meals, I, I feel that being at the conference and, and listening to the opening speech and, and, and seafood fishing doesn't even rate a mention on the, uh, on the statistics, considering it's $2.5 billion dollars um, you know, the only mention of seafood was in reference to some labelling issues. To me, it's, it's, it, we, we have an underdog status. I love that. I love that. And, and I think, you know, for me it's about putting all those other guys on notice. The horticulture guys, the beef guys, the chicken guys, the poultry. And I think that over the coming years that our real estate space in the supermarkets is going to grow because, let's face it, you look at a piece of beef and beef is beef is beef. But there are so many different types of seafood from prawns, squid, octopus, crab, a whole range of different, different types of products that when presented in this format, you know, it's interesting, it's exciting. And so I think that as people become more comfortable with, uh, with cooking seafood, as, you can, as it is happening, um, we will start to take up more real estate space. I'm convinced of that. And with the discussions that we've had with uh, the different supermarkets and also with some of the independents who are wanting to range these types of products, it's sparking a lot of excitement. It has a steady growth rate. The reason why they're liked is because they don't smell. It doesn't smell. You don't have to touch it. You can take it home, you can peel the lid off, you can tip it into your frying pan, you can cook the product, and essentially it's not going to smell out your fridge. You don't have to touch it. And I think it, it's, it's a very comfortable way of handling seafood and touching and not having to touch seafood. As I said, the overseas performance, um, it's a very mature market, particularly in the UK. Um, they have a really extensive range of product where we can go over there and we can see what's going on, we can capture some of those ideas and concepts and bring them back here and try and start to plug that into our own businesses, getting the product into the right format. And it's proven that the shopping frequency for these types of products is uh, more than once a week. So there you go, there's a farm prawn. Why do I, as a Australian fishing company, have a picture of a farm prawn up there? Is that because I just want to annoy myself? Is it because I believe that there is some value in industry, both aquaculture and wild caught, to come together and pool their resources around a whole range of things from sustainability through to marketing? So with sustainability, there is a baseline expectation from the supermarkets. Let's face it, they're the guys that are starting to sell the most amount of seafood in this country. Both Woolworths and Coles have their own set of criteria. But as industry sectors like the MPF and the Spencer Golf, they've gone on board with the MSC certification. It's um, to, to, to work towards being able to, to go into the supermarkets and go to the public and say, we have sustainable environmental certification that has been checked and tested and it allows us to be able to work with any issues that the public may have, any environmental agencies may have about um, Australian seafood, particularly prawns. Also, um, with ethical standards, um, there is also now a requirement coming through um, from both internally within companies, but also with uh, different customer groups that are requiring companies to do uh, ethical audits on their businesses, so that it could be from products that you may have processed overseas and brought back, it could be um, different consumables that you use within your company. Where do your nets come from? They come from India. Who is manufacturing those nets? Having, having, having that audit done so that you can um, have comfort in knowing that 
all the activities that you do within your business uh, meet that, those standards. And those internal processes, so for ourselves we've got accreditations with the supermarkets, with Aquis, um, and so not only do we do that, but we also uh, we do our own internal process, our own internal audits. I can only uh, encourage uh, other fishing companies to, to sort of go beyond what they ha the criteria that they have to meet and start to, to work towards generating their own set of parameters that, that works towards be best practices. It could be that you're sharing information with other fishing companies and, and, and seeing where, you're, where you've got your um, you, you know, best practice in terms of your productivity throughputs and making comparisons with other fishing companies to make sure that, that what you're doing is benchmarked. A lot of these things are, are, are working towards really getting yourself in the door. So when you are having discussions with, with potential customers that you can showcase your business and you can meet all these different criteria and you can show them and you can say, this, this is what we're currently doing within, within our business. These are the things that we do in terms of best practices, in terms of sustainability, in terms of all the audits that we do. And, and that way it's, it's about sharing that message, sharing that information with your customers. So collaborative marketing, the way I see it is that as a, as a company ourselves, we, we could probably put $50,000 towards a marketing campaign, come up with a few ads on the radio, a few ads in the magazines or in, in, the, in the newspaper. As an industry group in terms of just say the northern prawn fishery, we could probably raise $100,000, $120,000 to come up with some ideas or some concepts about why our prawns are better than everybody else's prawns. And we did do that. We came up with a campaign, was the Go Wild, Go Bananas campaign. And it had some traction. Then we chose to come together as a whole of industry, including all the prawn, wild prawn catchers, as well as the aquaculturists uh, and the prawn farmers and we were able to raise close to $400,000. Uh, we had the support of the uh, FRDC and the C CRC and we were able to come up with much slicker concepts by the use of um, brand council. So instead of trying to think all these things up ourselves, we were able to engage with, with um, with companies that are specialised in these fields and were able to come up with really, really slick um, concepts that we then rolled out. We were able to roll, we rolled it out in the first year and now we're into our second year. In the second year, um, Brand Council then introduced a, a different team of, uh, of um, innovative thinkers they came up with a different set of concepts, so it really kept the whole program fresh. Uh, there's no way we would be able to do that as an individual company. There's no way we would be able to do it just as the Northern Prawn Fishery. But as a, a whole of uh, industry sector or group being the prawn catchers, we're able to pool our funds and pool our resources. And, and I think that it's, it's a great platform for other um, sectors within fishing to be able to, to see what we've done and, and maybe try and do the same thing themselves. So, online sales and marketing. Online sales and marketing and social media. Uh, we have our own Facebook page. I think there's close to 10,000 people we follow. We, um, we reach with everybody that, that sees our page and they like it and then their friends see it, we reach close to a couple of hundred thousand people a week. Um, there are a whole range of platforms that, that companies can use, including Twitter, 
Instagram, Pinterest and Tumblr. Um, I think it's important not only as a private company but also as an industry to have online presence and social media presence that is monitored and controlled and updated frequently so that we can get the message out there into the public right to the, right, right to the front line. With um, online sales ourselves, we have a, a, an online presence. Um, Christmas just gone, we took 1,000 online orders for pickup uh, of seafood for Christmas Eve. That was about $250,000 that hit our books before the product even went out the door. Um, it is a very low cost way of selling your product out into the marketplace. I think that uh, fishing companies, irrespective of their size, have equal opportunity, equal opportunity to do the same thing, to come up with uh, ways to, to sell their products out directly out into the marketplace by use of uh, online sales. So the shop versus the physical store, um, everybody's fully aware that operating a seafood shop uh, and the cost of labour and the cost of, um, um, of rent is, is, is exorbitant in this country and that, um, that if you already have uh, a business where you're handling seafood, the additional cost for you to be making up orders that you've taken online uh, is quite inexpensive. So external business forces, the things that we can't control, um, the Australian dollar, we can't control the Australian dollar, we can't control fuel prices. So what, we can, what we've been able to do, and I can only encourage other fishing companies to do the same, is that we've impl implemented a hedging policy uh, where we can actually hedge uh, our currency position as, as an exporter. Uh, by use of a whole range of different products that you can talk to your bank about. Um, I think hedging your currency at 50% of your sales is a very safe option. Uh, that way you're not really playing the money market but you're actually just protecting your position. Um, it's worked very well for us. I think that it's something that, uh, that companies that have an export presence uh, should have as part of their, uh, as part of their policy. Similarly with fuel, uh, there's, there's a lot of uh, fuel hedging options at the moment. Right now as the fuel price has, has dropped, uh, a lot of those fuel hedging options have become quite affordable. Uh, there's one called Platts Gasoline, uh, which is one that we've used. We've hedged 25% of our fuel going forward. That's a very inexpensive policy. It, it's a ceiling policy so that as the, if the fuel price continues to fall, you can subscribe to those lower prices, but as, as it hits the ceiling, it doesn't, it's not going to cost you any more. Um, I think, though, you know, these are the things we can't control, but there are things that we can do to protect our position. Innovation. So I've just put a number of different things up there that I'll just very quickly talk about. So innovation in, bu in business. So innovation is one of those things that, that you can introduce into your business as a business culture. So in my company, what I did about 12 months ago that, you know, every week we ca get together with my senior leadership team and we, uh, I, on a rotation, everybody has to bring something to the table that's innovative that is not necessarily about seafood or fishing. We ran that program for about six months because it was a way for us to practice talking about innovation, thinking about innovative ideas, creating that culture of innovation within, within our business. Then uh, as time went on, we started changing the, the, the way that we were doing it and we then started to include um, fishing and our business related uh, activities as part of it because that culture had started to exist and we had practiced it and then we were starting to um, realise that there was a lot of opportunities because it was something that we were practising. Um, obviously in terms of uh, engineering technology, you know, there's, there's, a, there's a huge range of um, opportunities um, in terms of engineering 
that you can introduce into your business. Um, it, it could be... There's so many things, so, so many. And, uh, and again, it's just a, a, an extension of, uh, of, of talking about those, those innovative things and rolling them out. Uh, automation versus people, again, is one of those... Uh, another one of those, um, you know, replacing people in a production capacity with uh, automation. And for ourselves, because we've been able to, we've been, you know, obviously making money in the last couple of years, for the first time in our business, we're now being able to reinvest into uh, different pieces of automation that allows us to, to improve our productivity and throughput. Offshore processing is uh, something that we've uh, entered into ourselves. So what we've done is we take our product and we ship it overseas and we turn it into something with a much greater value and we bring it back. The reason why we did that is because we weren't able to, in the last couple of years, we weren't able to invest very much money in automation in our factories. So it really lent itself to a, a, a sort of a stopgap measure for us to do something with our product. There's so many processing facilities around the world, particularly in Southeast Asia, that, that are actually very high tech, have very high hygiene standards, food, very high food safety standards, and for ourselves, a couple of things that, that have worked very well for us is we send saddle tail fillets, or so, sorry, whole saddle tail to Vietnam, processed into fillets, crumbed and brought back. The good thing about that is, is that we've identified that in Australia, if you go to a fish and chip shop and you order fish and chips, generally you get a piece of bassa, or it's a piece of imported fish. So there's actually not a lot of crumbed Australian fish in this country. So we've been able to do that. It is product of Australia. Also with our prawns, <coughs> oh, excuse me. With our prawns, we've been able to um, um, ship them to Indonesia, process them into meat and cutlets, and then bring them back as a, uh, as a finished product. It's worked very, very well for us. Just the, co the cost differentiation between doing it here and doing it there. It costs us about $10 a kilo in production cost to do it here. And in comparison to shipping it to Indonesia, um, processing it and bringing it back for $2 a kilo. And that includes shipping. So it goes to show that if you've got any production in this country that is very um, manual, um, requires a lot of manual labour, that it in comparison to what's just on our doorstep, we can, uh, we can look to get our $5 a kilo product and turn it into a $20 a kilo product quite easily. Um, packaging and configuration in the marketplace is probably the key message that, that I'd like to share with everybody and that really is about turning your product that you already catch now or produce into something of a greater value by means of getting it into the right format. So how do we know that we're getting into the right format? I mean, you look at the fruit and veg guys, they send their fruit and veg often to the fruit markets in bulk on consignment and they get back a price afterwards. So that's what we're trying to avoid. All the product that we're selling uh, in our company, none of it gets sold on that, in that format. We've got total control of what we do. We make sure that we get it in the right format. What is the right format? How do we find out what the right format is? It, it just takes a lot of travel, a lot of talking, a lot of searching out markets, looking at what's in the marketplace, and then rolling that into your business and getting that right format. Talking to other people within the fishing industry about what is it that they do. A lot of companies now are sharing that, that, that information with each other, those ideas amongst themselves. Because you can see there's a younger group of people coming through the industry now. And those younger people uh, have a greater level of sophistication around marketing. There's no doubt. And a lot, of those, a lot of those people that I'm seeing coming through our business who've got innovative ideas are really keen to share it with other people, their, their other peers within the industry. And, that, and that's a huge change. So the future of the industry. So for me, the future of the industry with the 
the Australian dollar dropping, the cost of fuel falling, the opportunities there are, are huge. There's no doubt. For me, the future is about getting our product into the right format to add value to our product. And you will see us go from two and a half billion to three billion dollars pretty quickly by doing that. And in the years to come, we will get noticed at, at, at the conference. People will be talking about the fishing industry. We won't, we, we can become something more than what we are now. And, um, and I think that's a really wonderful opportunity for us. Thank you.